Hi guys, this is GSNO.com and I'm here with a review of the Asus Zenfone 9, one of the smallest phone I've handled this year and it's one of those compact handsets with a lot of power inside. Now, we're dealing here with a device which was launched recently and is priced at quite an affordable rate of $800. It's also got to be the first non-gaming phone with a brand new Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 processor inside and its diagonal is something rare. Because it's below 6 inches in diagonal, it also has a special camera with a gimbal and 6 axis stabilization. It was unveiled on July 28 and we're here with a full review. So as you can see we have the red version of it, it also comes in black, blue and a silver version. It's IP68 certified, this feels a bit like a rug, it has a texture of a rug, it's actually a special polymer, basically a plastic based material. We have an aluminum frame here, which is quite beefy by today's standards, uh, reaching 9.1 mm in thickness and it all weighs 169 grams, which by any measurement means that we're dealing with a very, very light phone. At the same time, it's meant for one hand usage, your fingers can easily reach the buttons here, the power button and the volume buttons, and the thumb can reach any part of the screen, plus there's that extra mode, uh, there's a special mode triggered with a swipe down, which lets you make the screen even smaller. Okay, so solid build, but a bit beefy, and people have been complaining to me about the thickness of the bezels on this device, so that's something to keep in mind here. In spite of the fact that it's so small, the bezels are quite thick around the panel. I find it maneuverable and uh, with an excellent grip, so not much objections from me. There aren't many tiny phones on the market, so people may be tempted by it. We can now discuss the screen, the screen that we have here. Well, uh, this one is a um, 5.92 inch panel with a Super AMOLED panel, by the way, Full HD Plus resolution, HDR10 Plus support, 120Hz refresh rate, Gorilla Glass Victus protection, and uh, luckily no curves. It's a completely flat panel, which is something good for gamers. Now the punch hole here at the top side for the selfie camera feels a bit big, but you'll be able to tell more about that once we start playing this test video. And uh, by the way, the chin is also a bit on the large side. Now you can clearly see uh, the bezels I was talking about, the chin and the curved corners of this panel. I mean, yes, it's a bright and crisp screen. It also has wide view angles and a pretty wide range of colors. The contrast is pretty solid even in full sunlight, so I don't have objections except for the bezels. There are deep blacks here and we put the screen under the microscope only to find a pentile matrix pixel arrangement. Going further than that, we measure the brightness and as you can see here on our sister website, it may be a good result at 494 lux, but I've seen better. It does surpass the Vivo X80 Pro, tested by us recently, and also the Galaxy S21 Fan Edition, but it stays below the predecessor, the Zenfone 8, which had over 600 lux. It's also below the Galaxy S22 Plus and below the Xiaomi 12. Now we go further than that and we address the CPU. As I said before, this is the very first phone which is not a gaming phone and hosts the brand new Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 processor, this time made by TSMC, not Samsung, based on a 4 nanometer pro uh, process and using Octa cores. It promises a 10% bump in performance from the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 and 30% better power management. The version we have here, aside from being so red, uh, it's the one with 16 gigs of RAM, LPDDR5 and 256GB of storage UFS 3.1. There's no lag, luckily, and you can run any game, and I do mean any game, I even installed Apex Legends, Diablo Immortal, Diablo Immortal, excuse me, and the new Noah's Heart, which wants to be a rival for Genshin Impact. There are also modes for the functioning of the device, which you can easily access here. These are the main modes high performance, dynamic, durable and ultra durable, you can find them in the battery section. Okay, so uh, it may run games fine with the highest resolution available, but it also gets a bit hot, particularly in the frame area. As far as the benchmarks are concerned, we have benchmarks here and we start with the classic on 229. As you can see, an amazing score, 1 million points, well, 1 million and change. Second place only to the ROG Phone 6 Pro, also from Asus. Second place once again in Antutu 8, 
following the ROG Phone 6 Pro, beating all the other flagships, even if they're called Galaxy S22 Ultra, even if they're called Oppo Find X5 Pro, OnePlus 10 Pro, Xiaomi 12 Pro, we beat everything. In Geekbench 5 Multicore, third spot, only surpassed by the iPhone 13 Pro series, beating the newly tested Nubia Red Magic 7S Pro and the Asus ROG Phone 6 Pro. So this is a very powerful device. It may cheat a bit maybe with a high performance mode, but it does feel pretty future-proof and powerful. At the same time, let's check out the 3D Mark Slingshot Extreme. As you can see, first place by quite a margin, meaning we have an excellent GPU here. And it's an excellent device for gaming, even though the screen doesn't exactly recommend it for that. Now, uh, these benchmarks come hand in hand with the temperature test, and we achieved 55.6 degrees Celsius in benchmarks. This is the sacrifice and the price you pay for having such high benchmarks. In games, things are more decent at 35.7 degrees Celsius. However, in my own experience, if you play intensive games on an ultra level, this frame gets hot after about 15 minutes. So be advised. Now let's talk about the battery. It's a 4,300 mAh battery. The predecessor had a 4,000 mAh battery and the charging sticks to around 30 watts with a charger in the box. Okay, so as far as battery life is concerned, what we have here is a video playback time of 18 hours and 4 minutes, which is pretty satisfying. It's a solid result. It's above the Xiaomi 12X and the Asus Zenfone 8 by 5 hours, also above the Galaxy S22 Ultra. It's below the Xiaomi 12, which is a small phone, and below the Realme GT2 Pro. This is a more relevant test, PC mark, continuous usage, an impressive 16 hours and 14 minutes, quite good, it's actually top 20 material, beating the Zenfone 8 by crazy 7 hours and beating the Galaxy S22 Ultra and also the Xiaomi 12. Fun fact, it's the exact same continuous usage as the Zenfone 6. It's below the Vivo V23, the Realme GT Neo 2 and the ROG Phone 6 Pro from Asus. The charging is a bit long by today's standards, 1 hour and 18 minutes. At the same time, after about 30 minutes, you should be all set with 56% battery, considering the long battery life. Now, when it comes to acoustics, we have stereo speakers and believe it or not, we even have an audio jack here at the top. They're co-working, these two uh, slits here are for the bottom speaker and this slit is for the top speaker and uh, Asus gives us something extra, um, it's called Audio Wizard with quite a few tuning options from Dirac to scenario effects and a 10 channel equalizer, extra treble and extra bass to name just a few. And of course we have some music prepared. of ideas. Uh, you probably felt it during this uh, tiny playback experience that the bottom speaker is doing all the heavy lifting, the top one not so much. Excellent bass here, but the back side, this polymer, vibrates a lot. It even scares you that it may pop up at some point. Just an illusion, but the impression remains. Okay, a punchy bass. Um, I would say that the volume feels a bit modest, mid-level. It's a pleasant sound without distortion, so there you have it. The stereophony, well, not so much, as I said, the bottom speaker is doing the heavy lifting. Now, uh, we did a bunch of tests here and with an acoustic sample we achieved 75.4 decibels with the bottom speaker, uh, once again with the acoustic spec, excuse me. So, with the top speaker and an acoustic sample we achieved 75.4 decibels, also with an acoustic sample with a bottom speaker, 80.2 decibels. There's a difference, the bottom speaker is more powerful. With this result, we surpassed the iPhone 13 Pro and Galaxy S22 Plus, but well below the Zenfone 8 and the Xiaomi 12. Now, when it comes to the gaming, we're at 97.4 decibels. We've seen better, it's just okay. It's above the Galaxy S22 Plus and the OnePlus 10 Pro. It's below the predecessor Zenfone 8 and the Vivo X80 Pro. When it comes to the camera, let me start off with the one cut in the screen here. In this poncho, there's a good news, it's a Sony sensor, 12 megapixel and it has autofocus finally, no longer a fixed focus selfie camera on a flagship. 
If you go to the back side, things are pretty simple. Two cameras with large lenses. The main one is a 50 megapixel Sony one, IMX766. It has optical stabilization and a an, um, gimbal. It's a hybrid gimbal OIS system with six axis stabilization, which is quite solid. F1.9 aperture and also an LED flash next to it and phase detection autofocus. Then we have the 12 megapixel ultra wide camera with 130 degree capture, Sony sensor again and autofocus for your macro needs. This baby shoots 8K video in 24 frames per second and have two microphones with special OZO acoustics. Now there are multiple modes which I already showed you when we performed the unboxing and I think it's time to actually go in depth with the uh, camera shots. Okay, so uh, first of all, we have two aspects of the daytime gallery. I visited a Cuban themed restaurant and I was quite impressed by the richness of the colors here. Even if you're in the main camera or the ultra wide camera, the colors stay the same. So once again, main camera, ultra wide camera, main camera, ultra wide camera. The colors are pretty much the same. They're rich, the palette is quite wide. And this is a close up I took with the phone, one of the many, because uh, I try to convince myself if it's any good or not when it comes to close ups and macros. I would say it lacks constants on account of the fact that we also have superb macros and some missed shots. So there's that. Once again, enjoying the sights of this Cuban themed restaurant and the way it distributes the light on a torrid day covered by some shades. And check out these colors here. This time we're inside. People have been asking me try to take more shots of indoors locations and this phone seems to handle it like a champ. Nice details on this bike, this chopper, I think. Once again, a regular shot and ultra wide. Now, at the outside, stepping out in the sun, I felt that the vegetation was a bit exaggerated with its greenness. I mean, the color green here is a bit too intense for my liking when the sun hits it directly. So there is this building here and this is the version with the ultra wide. However, I like the way the sky is rendered. I didn't skip this selfie, so let's analyze them. It's one of the good phones when it comes to the selfies. I'm loving the details, the texture and uh, the expression of the eyes. You can definitely tell it's a quality selfie camera. At last, I would even go as far as to say that it's superior to the recently tested Vivo X80 Pro selfie camera wise. I mean, I don't think it goes to the length of the superb Galaxy S series selfie cameras, but it's there. Going back to the main camera, check out this photo. It's good enough for sightseeing and putting on a cover of a visited city. So I'm pretty happy with what this camera can deliver. I can only object most times when it comes to the vegetation, this is a different day with an even more torrid sun. And this is where we have more greens. We are in the park. And even though I'm complaining about them being slightly oversaturated, it's not as bad as it happened with the, if you remember, Galaxy S20 Plus. So all in all, a pretty fine experience. And I have an area here where you can find quite a few colors. We got your reds, we got your yellows. We also have some blues. And I find that the ultra wide camera may turn the reds into pink at times. But once again, the selfie camera shines in detail, face expression, focus, and what have you. And of course, we also have some bokeh shots. And I think the bokehs are actually here, separating me in an excellent manner from the background. But it's a discrete separation. You wouldn't say it's a separation if you didn't look closely. And I find that interesting. It's at the same time discreet and at the same time intense when it comes to the portrait application here. Quite fine close up on this ring here on a rope. As I said before, it's hit and miss. We have both excellent close ups and macros and underwhelming ones. A lot of shots here. My conclusion is that one of the phones that this Zenfone 9 reminded me of is actually the Honor Magic 4 Pro. It's pretty close to its league. So that's a pretty big plus and its selfies are actually better than most flagships on the market right now. I think it can fight a Xiaomi. It can even go ahead and fight a Galaxy S22 and that's not bad at all. It's a huge upgrade from the Zenfone 8 and 7 which were a bit disappointing in the summer days and that's daytime capture. Now let's talk about the low light. 
Okay, so let's talk about the pictures taken during the night time. And let me start off by saying that uh, I'm not as impressed as those at those taken during the night as I was with those taken during the day. First of all, the low light photos with the ultra wide camera are a letdown. The street light halos are a bit big, and there is a slight tint of purple around the edges. Now the main camera shots are okay, however I find that there, there are these extra halos here, some orange and the purple ones which are a bit annoying, so there's that. I mean, there are some okay shots, especially those with the night mode on, however they don't stand a chance against the Galaxy S22 Ultra, Vivo X80 Pro, and this for example is a bit too warm and orange for my taste. You can take several good looking architectural shots if you're traveling, but I feel that you can also do the same with a high mid-range phone, so there you have it. This is one of the better shots, I'll admit it. A lot of detail went here, and an excellent way of capturing the light. However, once again, nowadays the standards have grown quite a lot, and I had greater expectations from this phone. However, I feel a slight improvement from its predecessors. Now, the time has come to discuss the whole gimbal thing and the stabilization as we approach the video section. So we have no less than 19 videos and let me start off with the one uh, related to the focus. It's this one here, we're alternating focus between the uh, cocktail flower of a pina colada and the background, which is the wall behind it. Quite nice alternation of focus, so it checks out. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have here. I have multiple shots of uh, walking around. So this is um, stabilization test number one without any sort of stabilization option activated. You can actually feel it. You can see it's a bit sloppier. Um, you can feel every left and right step. However, I don't see any refocus or any flicker. And then we have the standard stabilization option. You can definitely tell there's something going on here, it's in 4K still, but it feels like a special travel track for the people shooting a movie. I'm actually pretty impressed by the stabilization in 4K. Then we have the Hyper Steady, which only works in Full HD. You lose a bit of detail, but things are perfectly stabilized. So there's that. I had the opportunity of testing two gimbal phones over the summer, Vivo X80 Pro and the Zenfone 9. And they can actually fight each other pretty well, although the Vivo has the advantage of being able to be rotated and keep its X axis, which is something that this model doesn't do. Okay, so we also have selfie videos like this one. I mean, it's okay and all, but the contrast is a bit too intense and my face is a bit too white. I like the focus and the details, that's fine. But uh, with the face uh, would have been less exposed, I would have been happier with the result. And as you can see in the shade, it's actually a bit more satisfying. Okay, so let's try something with more color this time. I'm actually happy to see here that the reds, blues and yellows are very well calibrated. However, when you're panning, once again panning in 4K or 8K, you will notice a bit of, uh, well, stabilization loss. You can see the shakiness of the image, so there is that. Okay, so um, another video here it involves a lot of red, rendered in a pretty fine manner. This is in the shade, and you can definitely tell it's the shade, not the direct sun. I love the quality and how crisp the image is. I remember that both the Zenfone 7 and the Zenfone 8 had problems in the summer with the sunlight and with the green vegetation. While this one does render a bit more intense vegetation, it's nothing worrisome compared to its predecessor, so that's a big plus. So this has been daytime filming, color me impressed. As far as small phones go, this is one of the best ones, and this is the low light video which we have here. Surprisingly, the low light video actually feels a bit better than the low light photos, somehow. I'm happy with everything from the colors to the clarity to the lack of uh, extra big halos for the lights. And even when walking around and filming, I'm pretty satisfied with the result. Not bad, not bad at all, but still there are a few other phones on the market which can do the same. Okay, but this is the smallest one of them, so there you have it. Now, as far as the connectivity is concerned, we're going to talk here about something like um, USB-C 2.0 port at the bottom. We have a dual nano SIM card play here. There's NFC. We also have a USB OTG, just so you know. And a special multi-antenna setup, so you won't lose your connection when you're gaming. 
We also have two microphones with auto noise cancelling, Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.2, GPS, dual band, GLONASS, Galileo, Beidou, QZSS, Navic and uh, 5G of course. The calls were pretty loud and clear and when it came time to test the stabilization, we involved good old speed test with the results being as follows. We have quite a few tests by the way. We start with 613 mega per second in download on Wi-Fi and 881 mega per second in upload. When it comes to 5G, I'm pretty impressed by the 522 mega per second downloads and 73.6 mega per second uploads. As far as the OS is concerned, this is obviously Android. It's actually Android 12 with Zen UI 9 applied on top of it, and it promises two years of OS updates and four years of security patches. Now, you are using gesture navigation, as you can see here, this is the recent area, and aside from the split screen and recents, we also have a sidebar to play with, which is this one and triggers all the useful settings. Now, the core of the phone remains its uh, special sensors integrated into the power button, which also holds the fingerprint scanner, which as you can see, works fine. However, there's more to this sensor than your typical touch. We can also do a bunch of swipes on it to trigger various features, but you have to go to a special dedicated area. So you go to advanced, smart key, and you can either press it twice to do open all of these things. You can press and hold to do this, or you can do the whole quick access, like I'm doing right now to check the notifications, but there are more. These are the gestures you can perform. You can take your finger and swipe it on it to refresh a web page, to go to the home or end of a web page, to play media, or once again, check the notifications as I'm doing right now. And when you're done, you swipe up and you close it. So it's the core of the idea that Asus is promoting of one hand usage with this phone, also highlighted by this thing I'm trying to trigger right now, this half a screen, which makes you simulate an even smaller diagonal screen where you do all your job and all that you need to do. Okay, so uh, those are the aspects so far. There's also a lot of customization. So if you keep the screen pressed, you got your wallpapers and the style, your widgets. This is the widget picker, the brand new widget picker from Android 12. We got your preferences here, grid size and so forth. Got your wallpapers and styles with the material U being drawn from the wallpaper. Lovely main wallpaper, by the way. And the system color scheme is available here as well, unless I'm missing it, dark or light. Actually, dark should look more elegant and hides those big bezels. And uh, let's see what else we have here. So um, the settings hide some of the other useful things. So we got the connectivity section, we got the apps, we got the storage, we got the battery, we got the privacy. And of course, uh, we got the privacy dashboard showing the access resources by the apps over the past uh, hours or minutes, microphone access and so forth. You'll see the green symbol here if your camera is being accessed. You've got your passwords and you've got your advanced section with a smart key, with a mobile manager keeping resources in check, as well as the game Genie, which was taken straight from the ROG phone series. There are the twin apps, basically two accounts on the same app, Edge tool, which is basically your sidebar, and Optiflex for optimization. These are the gestures. We have the one-handed mode, which you saw earlier, and you can do a double tap on the back side to take a screenshot, so you can also associate more features to it. When the screen is on, hold the back of the phone and double tap the back to quickly perform some of the actions. I mean, uh, I've been trying to do this, but I have yet to succeed in it. Not very sure how or when to do the tap. Oh, I just did it. So, takes a bit of training. But in the end, you should be able to perform it. Okay, and there's a pocket mode and a glove mode. And uh, since I mentioned Game Genie, if you access a game like the one I just installed, Noah's Heart, you'll be able to actually see that uh, special window of options for gamers. It's here. It looks just like it did on the ROG phone I tested recently. And it has quite a few options related to performance, real-time information, navigation, alerts. Um, there's the macros, lock touch, edge tool, and so forth. By the way, this is a pretty nice RPG called Noah's Heart, which I'm going to play for you as we list the pros and cons on the of the device. Okay, so this is a lovely MMORPG, which I'm playing on the Zenfone 9. And I promised to mention some of the pros and cons of the handset. On the pro side, it's got one of the comfiest uh, one-hand usages on the market right now. And at the same time, uh, um, 
it's very powerful as you saw before when it came to the uh, when it came to the benchmarks now aside from that i should probably also mention that uh, uh, it has a good battery life actually hours better than the predecessor five seven hours and uh, we also have ip68 certification as a plus a pretty good brightness of the screen uh, good speakers all around great selfie even above expectations and overall the camera feels like a serious upgrade from the zenfone 8 and 7 peaks and vids solid stabilization actually one of the best on the market and uh, i should also mention that we have a pretty good price for a flagship phone um, nice customization of the interface and uh, fast connectivity those were the pros on the cons it's thick and it's got thick bezels considering its minute size uh, it gets pretty hot in games i can uh, actually confirm that and uh, the charging takes a bit long by today's standards um, i also feel that the back side is a bit of a compromise for a flagship that polymer thing is not exactly welcome on a flagship nowadays now uh, other things were mentioning for the cons the close-ups were a bit hit and miss also um, some of the greens were a bit too intense for my liking i'm talking about the green of the vegetation even though it's clearly better than the predecessor and um, i've seen gimbal applied a bit better in vivos camp although this is the first time partnership we don't have a micro sd car slot and we also don't have a wireless charging so that may be a drawback for some people and uh, I think we've covered basically everything as far as the pros and cons are concerned. If there's anything else, you can definitely find it in a text review. Now, some ideas about this phone. It's definitely a niche nowadays. Phones below 6 inches in diagonal. You can name a few. Some iPhones, uh, maybe also Pixel 5a or Pixel 6a from Google. And that's about it. There are some uh, also other some other phones which are small like the um, Galaxy S22 or the Xiaomi 12. However, they go past six inches in diagonal, so there you have it. It's a niche phone. Asus knows exactly what it's doing. And it excels in stabilization here, battery life, and performance. Be careful with the whole heating thing of the frame in the games. Be careful with the detail, and in the end, it's clear that people with small hands will buy the phone, and people who crave one hand usage because they always have the other hand busy i would say that asus reinvented one hand usage on this phone but more through software rather than hardware which has pretty much peaked as far as small phones are concerned that's it from jsn.com hope you enjoyed the review of the asus zenfone 9 goodbye